Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be. Uh, our audience uh, today is circling the globe, which is wonderful. Uh, and I see our number of participants spiraling uh, northward. So this is tremendous. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, so welcome to the first webinar in the second global summit on food fortification virtual series focused on reaching the most vulnerable with fortified foods. The very important nature of that. We are delighted to welcome you to the conversation uh, today, which has been put together for you all by the Iodine Global Network, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, Helen Keller International, UNICEF, the Chef's Manifesto, and Harvest Plus. This webinar is being live streamed on the GAIN website and YouTube channel. Uh, I think you may be able to see the links in the Q&A box. So we want this to be a very dynamic uh, conversation. Uh, so please put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll all do our best to direct them to our uh, brilliant uh, and uh, very uh, notable speakers uh, today. So the timing of this series couldn't be better, unfortunately, for the pandemic, as we all know, continues to rage, expanding the global health crisis, and if we have seen with the profound fallout on the global food system, it is also exacerbating the impact on nutrition, particularly in the crisis, particularly the crisis of micronutrient malnutrition, especially among the world's most vulnerable. Here's the reality that we're facing. Women and children are among the most vulnerable populations in the world, suffering disproportionately from illness, poverty, and malnutrition. Half the world's children under the age of five, that's about 340 million children in total, suffer from hidden hunger or significant deficiencies in one or more essential vitamins and minerals. Hidden hunger is not immediately apparent. That's why it's called hidden. But it has a devastating impact on women's lives and children's health and development, especially during the first thousand days, this extremely critical time from the beginning of a mother's pregnancy to the second birthday of her child, which can perpetuate a vicious cycle of poor health and poverty. Deficiencies in vitamin A, iodine, iron, folate, and many other nutrients are among the biggest burdens on public health in our world. So we'll be learning more about that as we move forward today. I have seen these impacts myself, these impacts on physical and cognitive stunting during my reporting on hunger and malnutrition in the 21st century. Most recently, just before the coronavirus began its relentless march around the world, I was in Ethiopia in a fourth grade classroom. This, class this classroom is in an area that was severely impacted by the famine of 2003. The childhood malnutrition back then was vast and severe. Now, nearly 20 years later, the impact on those children above all the cognitive stunting is profound. In that fourth grade classroom of the 60 plus students that were in there the day I visited, more than half are 18 years old and above. Young adults just beginning to read and write and do simple math. Here in this classroom, you can see the life sentence of underachievement that comes from childhood malnutrition and stunting. It's a remarkable cost, a horrific cost for the individuals and their families and communities. And for all of us, for just imagine what those children, those young adults now might have accomplished for all of us, were they not stunted by childhood malnutrition? You see, a lost chance of greatness for any one child anywhere in the world becomes a, because of malnutrition becomes a lost chance of greatness for all of us. But it doesn't have to be that way. We know the solutions. We see them at work. In particular, staple food fortification and biofortification of crops. The benefits are clear and profound. I saw them at the children of India, Uganda, Guatemala, and Chicago as I followed them for the first thousand days book. You can see by the development markers their physical growth, their alertness, their better health, their readiness, their eagerness actually to begin school. Large scale food fortification adds essential vitamins and minerals into the foods that people are already consuming every day, like flour, cooking oil, salt, sugar, rice. Biofortification increases the nutrient levels in staple crops like beans and sweet potatoes. 
usually through traditional plant breeding techniques. Neither of these, of course, are silver bullets, but they can be a huge part of the solution. Together, this large-scale fortification and biofortification are among the best, most cost-effective ways to reach large populations of vulnerable people with the vitamins and minerals they need to survive and to thrive. Last November, the second Global Summit on Food Fortification launch event helped mobilize high-level political will to pursue the unfinished agenda on large-scale fortification and biofortification and to demonstrate high-level attention and commitment to the fortification agenda across sectors and stakeholders. So we'll begin with a summary video that sets the scene for our discussion today. Nigeria has shown that we are capable of successfully implementing large-scale fortification programs. We've been able to put in place both a policy and legal framework that is able to promote food fortification. We estimate that at least one in two of the world's children suffers from hidden hunger, deficiencies in vitamins and other essential nutrients. Large-scale fortification and biofortification can help us to address this issue. There is a high level of accomplishment to report on since the first summit, 11 countries covering 215 million people passed fortification legislation since Arusha. And if pending legislation passes in India on edible oil and milk, we can add another 500 million people to this tally. We, need, we definitely need to find a solution that's fast and furious. So food fortification. Number one, it's cost effective. Number two, it's evidence-based. And number three, it's very resilient. The priorities for the local production of fortified food, a great opportunity to create jobs for young people and the women. There is no reason why fortified rice should not be cooked in the best kitchens in the world. It can't harm and it can increase the nutrition value, so why not, right? Let's see what the guests think about this. So, as you can see, all these efforts are gaining momentum, uh, and this, what we're going to be hearing today, uh, will continue to uh, push us forward and spur that uh, momentum to keep going. So today we'll be focusing on three case studies, posing the question, well, how can we consolidate these gains in salt iodization, edible oil, biofortified crops, and improve the health and resilience of vulnerable communities, wherever they may be in the world? Uh, to our speakers today, our great roster of speakers uh, also spans the globe like our audience. Uh, our speakers will be coming to you today from Senegal, from Cameroon, from Zimbabwe, and from India, Canada, and the U.S. Uh, and so what we're going to be doing, uh, we'll, we'll be starting off now, so it's my pleasure uh, to introduce you to our first speaker, to our first speaker Dr. Victor Aguayo who's the Associate Director and Global Chief of Nutrition for UNICEF uh, for today's opening remarks. Uh, Dr. Aguayo was appointed the Global Chief of UNICEF Nutrition in October 2016, and his remarkable career has been guided by the conviction that hunger and malnutrition are a violation of children's rights and abomination to our society. 
Dr. Aguayo has 25 years of uh, experience in maternal and child health nutrition in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So nobody better to uh, get us started uh, today. So Dr. Aguayo, great to have you here uh, and please take it away. Thank you, Roger. Let me first check that you can hear me. Yes, very good, thank you. Very good, well, thank you, Roger and dear colleagues. I'm extremely pleased to see the names of so many friends on our screens. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to this webinar on reaching the most vulnerable with uh, fortified foods. Last year was an important year to UNICEF. In 2020, as many of you know, we launched our nutrition strategy 2020-2030, which outlines our vision, our goal, and our priorities for maternal and child nutrition in the final decade towards the SDGs in 2030. The strategy, our strategy, acknowledges a triple burden of malnutrition threatening children. First, the unfinished agenda of undernutrition, both stunting and wasting. Second, the growing epidemic of overweight and obesity, including in low and middle income countries. And third, the widespread epidemic of micronutrient deficiencies across countries and regions. And yes, we made a deliberate choice to speak of a triple, not a double, but a triple burden of malnutrition to give micronutrient deficiencies precisely the policy and program relevance and visibility they deserve, and to signal that micronutrient deficiencies coexist with stunting and wasting on the one hand, but also with overweight and obesity. Our strategy highlights a key principle of UNICEF nutrition programs across the world, across countries and regions. This principle is that prevention comes first for all children, for all adolescents, for all women, in all contexts, both in development and in humanitarian settings. And because prevention comes first, our strategy acknowledges the key role, the vital role of the food system in providing nutritious, safe, affordable, and sustainable diets to all children, to all adolescents, to all women. It also acknowledges the key role and the potential of fortified foods to fill the nutrient gaps where diets are nutrient poor and micronutrient deficiencies are prevalent. Fortified foods, we know it, can dramatically improve the quality of children's diets from early childhood through adolescence, as well as the diets of women and populations, including in the most vulnerable segments of our societies and communities. We in UNICEF do not think of fortified foods as a plan B or as an alternative to a healthy diet. We think of fortified foods as evidence-based, cost-effective solutions that are complementary to all other nutrition interventions. Solutions that are available to us to reduce the widespread burden of micronutrient deficiencies. For us in UNICEF, it is crystal clear that national governments have the primary responsibility for upholding children's right to nutrition. However, we also believe that the private sector has a key role to play. And when it comes to food fortification and fortified foods, private sector engagement is of the essence. Therefore, effective public private sector action on food fortification can contribute to a world free of micronutrient deficiencies and free of the burden that micronutrient deficiencies mean in terms of mortality, morbidity, and poor growth and development. In UNICEF, we stand ready to play our part and we want to work with all of you across countries and regions to support governments and nations deliver nutritious, safe, affordable and sustainable diets. Therefore, I look forward to spending time with you today and I thank you and I thank the organizers of this discussion on food fortification. Thank you, Roger, and back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, Victor, for setting the scene for, uh, yeah, really highlighting uh, the triple burden and that prevention is so critical and then the, the central nature of, of uh, fortification, food fortification, biofortification, and all these efforts. And particularly, uh, yeah, I really appreciate your mention of uh, the children's right uh, to nutrition uh, and to uh, uh, you know, really be uh, building the momentum uh, for that for that uh, movement as well. Uh, the human rights aspect of it, and the right to nutrition, the right to to food. 
even more critical as we see during the, the pandemic uh, and the impacts of that. So Victor, thank you very much uh, for that. And thanks for all your work uh, on this front and for leading the way uh, yourself and all your colleagues at, uh, at UNICEF uh, and all the best moving uh, forward. Uh, so moving forward ourselves this morning, I would like, now like to introduce uh, Dr. Vanner Schultink uh, by way of congratulations uh, for his new post, your new post as executive director of the Iodine uh, Global Network. Dr. Schultink uh, has had broad experience in nutrition, public health development, humanitarian program implementation, implementation throughout his career. Uh, he was the chief of nutrition for UNICEF uh, from 2007 to 2016, knows Victor very well, and most recently was the UNICEF country representative in Somalia and Kenya. Uh, from 2016 to 2019, uh, before uh, uh, yeah, putting on his his, his new hat uh, as executive director of the Iodine Global Network. Uh, so thank you, Berner, uh, for all you do, and thanks for joining us this morning, or this afternoon, or evening, wherever you may be. I'm morning, so thank you, <laughs> thank you. Yes, uh, from my end, uh, good morning uh, from Ottawa in uh, in Canada, uh, Roger. Thank you very much for your kind words and. Uh, I wish to welcome all the, uh, from what I see now, 411 participants to this uh, very interesting and important webinar. Um, before I start my presentation, I would like to thank my colleagues, uh, Joyce Green, Robin Houston, Arnold Timmer, and also the previous uh, director of the Iodine Global Network, uh, Jonathan Gorstein, for the inputs they made to the presentation I'm uh, about to, uh, to make. Uh, so if the first slide could come up, uh, please. All right, as you uh, see, we have uh, changed the title of the, uh, the presentation a little bit into a pinch of iodized salt can save the brains of millions. And um, we think that an emphasis on the brains of people and young children is of, uh, of key importance. Um, I want to talk about what I see, and I think many share that opinion, as one of the biggest, but unfortunately not very well known public health success of the last two to three decades. Um, so first of all, something about the importance of iodine. Um, iodine is an essential component of the thyroid hormones, and these hormones uh, have an influence on the metabolism uh, of the body, on the functioning of the neurological system, and on the development of the brain. Uh, mild deficiency of iodine can lead to a loss of uh, intelligence, and therefore to a loss of uh, learning capacity in school, uh, more sustained deficiency leads to a physical uh, manifestation called goiter, which is a, a lump here in the neck, uh, an enlarged thyroid gland. And severe deficiency leads to irreversible mental retardation. But it's indeed this loss of IQ and uh, a damaged brain if a woman uh, suffers from iodine deficiency during pregnancy, leading to a brain impact in the newborn, that that is the main and the biggest impact, which is of particular concern. Uh, the next slide, please. So this slide uh, may be a bit complicated, but I'll take you through it. Um, there are two very good ways to measure iodine deficiency. One is uh, to look at the percentage of people in a population who suffer from a swollen goiter, a swollen thyroid gland or a goiter. And nowadays, what we try to do more and more is to look at the concentration of iodine in a urine sample. And um, when the, uh, the median concentration of a lot of samples is below 100, we think that the population is deficient in iodine. Now, in 1993, or around that, you see on the picture on your left that um, most people in the world, and you have the, uh, the bubbles represent uh, countries, and the bigger the bubble, the bigger the population in the country. And the different colors uh, link to the different uh, classifications with respect to the regions which are used by the World Health Organization. Um, so you see that in the early 90s, 
um, most populations had a concentration of uh, iodine in the urine below 100, which denotes deficiency. And most populations had goiter rates above 10%. So both of these indicators indicated uh, a very highly prevalence of uh, iodine deficiency. Now, if you look at the right hand in 2015, you see that basically all countries now have an iodine a concentration in the urine above 100, and almost all countries have uh, less than 10% of their population suffering from goiter. So you see a shift of all the populations to the right in terms of urinary iodine, and you see a drop going down in terms of goiter rate. So a, a really much more desirable situation with respect to the uh, iodine nutritional status of populations across the world. Um, of course, the question is, why did we see this very positive development? Well, the answer is simple. The next slide, please. It is basically because 88% of the population in low and middle income countries has now access and use iodized salt. And in the map you see, uh, you have different colors. Uh, the darker the blue, the higher the percentage of households using iodized salt or having access to iodized salt, the darkest color is more than 80% in a country of the population, uh, such as in India, in uh, southern parts of Africa, uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, and so on. So really, the association between the use of iodized salt and uh, the progress towards the, uh, let's say, elimination of iodine deficiency is, uh, is very clear. And uh, this amazing uh, success has happened in a period of maybe less than 30 years. So you see that um, achieving enormous impact on global public health using uh, a food fortification, or in this case, a condiment fortification is very well possible. Uh, next slide, please. So now that we are in this uh, favorable situation, what do we need to do? First of all, it's important that you, to realize that salt needs to be iodized forever. So you can't stop it because then iodine intake will go down again. But we also recognize that food systems are changing. So it is necessary to continue with monitor and adapt programs around salt iodizations, regulatory frameworks, and so on. The same goes for the fact that global priorities and national contexts are changing. You have changing food patterns, you have the coming up of organic locally produced foods. There is uh, an attempt to reduce salt intake in order to lower blood pressure. Uh, we eat uh, more processed foods, and now we have a situation of COVID-19 which hampers the, uh, let's say, the global travel of goods and services. So also to that situation, we must adapt the, uh, the salt iodization program. We also unfortunately see that in some countries and regions, uh, a slipping back does occur. And uh, you saw in the previous map that Europe and uh, North America are colored gray. Um, that means that UNICEF and WHO do not track uh, the situation in those countries, but there is information from several scientific studies, which indicates that it may be that now up to 50% of newborns in Europe are at risk of iodine deficiency because their mothers don't have enough iodine in their food. So countries such as Ireland, Norway, Germany, are uh, really not in a very good shape. Um, so, and the final thing is that some countries, maybe 10, 20, 25, still need improvement. And we need to help them to get into a better place uh, to protect the brains of their, uh, of their children. I think one interesting fact nowadays is that due to the programs uh, implemented, for example, by UNICEF, by the World Health Organization, we see that many populations in Africa and Asia are better protected against iodine deficiency than citizens in Europe. And I find that uh, interesting, but also a bit shocking. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, my organization, the Iodin Global Network, attempts to monitor the global situation and we want to provide support in shaping the direction of programs and policies, both for uh, individual countries, but also for nations and for, let's say, programs of collaboration between uh, different parts of the world. Uh, we provide guidance on site salt ionization programming, especially uh, thinking about the changes which happen in the world nowadays. We are a depository of knowledge. We share that, of course, and we try to manage the uh, new knowledge which comes in and uh, you know, link it to existing knowledge. We see ourselves as a convener of partners, including uh, the salt industry for programs around salt ionization. And we attempt to advocate widely, but especially with important policymakers and decision takers uh, on the need to iodize salt. Next one. So in conclusion, universal salt ionization has been one of the biggest public health success stories in the last 25 years. Um, we managed to get there through the leveraging of the experience of many partners and managed to get them to work towards a common goal. And of course, one of the most important partners is the salt industry. And we worked with salt industry organizations, with individuals, with small producers coalitions and so on. And also the, the civic organizations, uh, you know, consumer organizations. And of course, with uh, public health and industry uh, officials to provide uh, policy and guidelines. Uh, but like I said, it is incredibly important to guard this success. We need a mechanism to sustain programs, to continue, um, let's say, to assure that optimal iodine status uh, exists. Uh, and of course, the main reason is to protect the brains of children. Uh, research indicates that a drop of eight IQ points on average due to iodine deficiency is not exceptional. And that of course uh, leads to a major impact, not only on individual development, but also on the development of a whole country. And then finally, uh, the Iodine Global Network aims to be at least play a very important role in putting up such a mechanism. Uh, Roger, back to you and thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Werner. Uh, it's quite some progress as you showed on, on your charts. Uh, and again, the reminder that, uh, yeah, we have to prevent against backsliding uh, and make sure that we protect the gains and move forward. And wow, that photo of the, of the classroom uh, also really took me back again to the to that classroom in, in Ethiopia where you can really see the impact uh, all these years later of uh, severe uh, malnutrition. I'm sure iodine uh, deficiency was indeed part of that. Uh, so thank you, Werner. I'd like now I'd like to introduce a joint presentation. Uh, Dr. Lamine Gay uh, is Helen Keller's International Regional Food Fortification Manager, uh, leading food fortification initiatives across Africa, including research on fortifying bullion. It's kind of a concentrated soup stock. Uh, fortifying bullion with micronutrients. And Mr. Alex Marco, on Helen Keller's International Program Advisor for Cameroon. Uh, he's playing a crucial role in the design and implementation of the country's uh, mission to fortify wheat flour uh, and edible oil with micronutrients. Uh, so, Lamine, Alex, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rogers, and uh, good morning to everybody uh, participating to this call. Uh, I will start by saying that, as many of you may, may know, uh, we have uh, uh, micronutrient deficiency are very prevalent across West African region. And personally, I had seen in a health center located in southern region of Senegal, many children uh, who, was, who were affected by xenophthalmia which is an eye disease caused by vitamin A deficiency. This is uh, uh, an experience which was very critical in my option to work in food fortification in order to contribute to the reduction of the prevalence of vitamin uh, A deficiency in West African region. And my ambition has been fulfilled through the Fortify West Africa project 
which, which has been funded by USAID and implemented by Ellen Keller International together with several uh, partners. This is a good example of a public-private uh, partnership to raise the nutrition status of the population and mainly for the vulnerable ones. Slide, please. We fortified cooking oil with vitamin A because oil is, uh, because oil is widely consumed by most of the population which will be rich regardless of their socioeconomic status. Uh, the scope of the project, please slide. The scope of the project covered all the 15 ECOWAS countries and mainly at the regional level. This is what we focus on. First, it was to develop and harmonize fortification standards across the region and also advocate government in the West African region to mandate fortification of locally produced and imported cooking oil. And finally, to build the capacity of government and regional institution for monitoring uh, and quality control of the fortification program. Slide, please. By implementing all this project with our partners, including Yomoa, ECOWAS, uh, this is what we realized in terms of achievement. By 2016, we had regional, regionally harmonized standards, which was ratified by Yoma. This uh, regional standard was about oil for cooking oil. Aside that, 13 of the 15 ECOWAS countries also had the individual mandatory uh, standard at national level. And uh, by survey we conducted in 2017, we realized that 74% of the West African population had access to cooking oil fortified with vitamin A. Slide, please. Here are some of the key elements which made the program successful in, in the West African region. We found that evidence was critical. At the start of the program, there was very uh, survey that documented micronutrient deficiency, which mainly convinced government and stakeholders that such intervention was important to improve the nutrition status of, of the vulnerable population. Another element that made the program successful is the enabling environment. We had legislation in place at the start of the program which mandated industry to fortify. There was, there was a huge advocacy and communication mainly to bring the various stakeholders on board as well as the consumer association to create awareness. Uh, in the same way, we developed a logo that was used by all the industry to certify that the product is, 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 fortified, is, fortified, is fortified. Now, um, uh, I stop here in terms of our regional success and hand over to my colleague Alex, uh, Alex from Cameroon, who will share with us the country-specific experience on cooking oil fortification. Thank you, Lamine, uh, uh, for your presentation. I, I, I'm, I'm pleased to share uh, with you uh, our experience in Cameroon uh, regarding your national food fortification and preventing uh, program. Uh, as you see in this, uh, in this slide, uh, since 2000, a national vitamin A survey revealed a prevalence of 35% of vitamin A deficiency among children. These results uh, uh, added to advocacy from the regional and national uh, 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 level, conducted a product, conducted a product government to create the national steering committee for the coordination and pilot all the aspects of the food fortification in Cameroon. After a baseline survey and an industrial assessment conducted in 2000, 2009, we've got the evidence that the prevalence of vitamin A is still high among the population and that the feasibility of all fortification with local industries is real. Uh, norms and standards of vitamin A making it mandatory have been reviewed in 2010 and the production of 45 all started in 2011, as you see on this slide. Next slide, she will play, please. Um, yes, uh, so we got some achievement uh, from, from this program started in 2011. First of all, the mandatory oil fortification becomes a law in Cameroon in 2011 with uh, 
I've seen the picture of the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Commerce, Ministry of Industry signing the, the, the RET. A recent survey conducted in 2019 showed that all the 12 local producers are fortifying the production in uh, with vitamin A with 90% complied with national legislation. We also found that the market of all the 10 regions are selling the fortified oil. We are still lacking of a recent survey at the household level to evaluate the final impact of the program. Next slide, please. So we cannot uh, conduct this uh, type of, of project without some challenges. So uh, the first challenge that we can talk is uh, high cost and difficulties for the procurements and the procedure for premix and the uh, equipment for fortification entrants. This is due to the fact that 100% of these equipment and premix are imported. Secondary, we can talk about the inadequate monitoring and enforcement. In fact, a recent survey uh, found that it still exists in the market more than 28 non-fortified imported oil brands in the market. And also, we found the presence of unbranded and non-traceable bulk oil, as, as you can see on these pictures. These results reveal that uh, there is a failure in the functioning of the border events and a non-systematic compliance with uh, standard and legislation concerning the bulk oil in the in the market so we can also uh, share the fact that it is still difficult uh, to keep all the partners engaged at all time for the program uh, and also that the commitment of uh, partners is not always translated into funding and uh, an action and also we still having a, a really need of impartial governor and open com com communication to keep all the steps of the program uh, on the right, on the right way. Uh, next, yes. Uh, thank you for your kind attention. I give. You, thank you. So, thank you very much, Alex and Lamine. Uh, for that uh, and your uh, swiftness and conciseness in moving through all of this. And I think it's really, uh, uh, again, impressive of the work that you've done uh, and great to hear about yeah, your own uh, and, and organization's uh, ambitions and optimism, but then also looking at the obstacles and kind of what, what, what lies ahead. And we can pick up more of that in the, the Q&A uh, time. So thank you very much. I'd now like to uh, introduce uh, Sikile Kundita. Sikile is the country manager and demand creation specialist for Harvest Plus uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, I've seen Harvest Plus on the ground in so many countries, uh, particularly in Africa. Um, and so I'm really excited that uh, Sikile is able to join us and speak about this. She's an agriculture and rural development practitioner with more than 20 years of experience in seed business management, <coughs> excuse me, community, seed systems, uh, nutrition sensitive agriculture and value chain uh, development. Uh, so she has great wisdom to share with us today. So uh, uh, thank you, uh, Tequila, and, and take it away. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Roger. And thank you everybody for uh, tuning in. Um, as already said, I'm very happy to be with you today and to share with you our experiences as Harvest Plus Zimbabwe in promoting biofortified crops. And the title of the slide says, leave no one behind with biofortification as you try to deliver these key essential micronutrients. Okay, next slide. Um, Zimbabwe, just like most other countries in the developing world, have a high burden of micronutrient malnutrition. Um, according to the most recent study done by the Minister of Health and Child Care in the country, we have 72% of uh, children under the age of five years and 61% of women of childbearing age suffering from iron deficiency, which is very high. We also have 19% of children under the age of five years and 23% uh, of women of childbearing age. Um, by childbearing age, I mean 15 to 49 years suffering from vitamin A deficiency, while stunting rates in the country are currently at about 
so recognizing the problem and then trying to solve it, the government of Zimbabwe has adopted a four-pronged approach to the problem, to tackle the problem. Which includes uh, supplementation, uh, maize meal, flour, cooking, dietary diversity is being provision, which is what I'm going to focus on today. Uh, just by way of definition, uh, biofortification is the conventional breeding of staple crops for high concentrations of key micronutrients. The focus uh, micronutrients in this case are iron, zinc, and vitamin A. It's important for me to emphasize at this stage that uh, the biofortified crops currently being, pro being promoted by Harvest Plus are all conventionally bred, which means they are non-GMO. This is key to mention given the global debate around GMOs and their non-acceptance in many developing countries or in many countries in Southern Africa, Zimbabwe included. Okay, but why staples? Um, the main advantage of biofortification is that the micronutrients are loaded onto staple crops. Staple crops are important because they're the most widely grown, the most widely consumed, and the most affordable to almost everyone in the community, the poorest of the poor. And they are, most, and they are the most resilient as well to economic and uh, food system shocks. The other advantage of uh, biofortifying the staple crops is that uh, by loading the micronutrients on staple foods, we make them available to everyone, every member of the household, including those uh, members of the household who in certain cultures are discriminated against when it comes to saving um, some micronutrient dense and more expensive food like animal products. Biofortification is also cost effective in that all that all it takes is a once-off investment in breeding the biofortified crop varieties. And once the varieties have been bred and released, there is no really much extra cost except the normal cost of seed multiplication and delivery, which cost would be incurred anyway if uh, we are working even with non-biofortified crops. And of course, the efficacy of biofortification in improving micronutrient malnutrition is well established through rigorous scientific research. Enough of the background, I want to get in now to what's happening in Zimbabwe. Well, biofortification has been around since, um, well, more than a decade ago, but Zimbabwe started promoting biofortified crops in 2015. This was under the auspices of a livelihood and food security program, which was funded by the UK aid and, and uh, managed by FAO, with Harvest Plus being a, a, a key, the, the main strategic partner, technical partner on biofortification. Through this program, we've reached more than 300,000 households um, with the biofortified crops. And the three biofortified crops being promoted in the country are vitamin A maize, vitamin A sweet potato, and iron rich beans. Now, um, the program has been able to reach um, members of um, the society, including members of a certain large religious sect in the country whose congregates are prohibited from visiting hospitals. Um, because they don't visit hospitals, the women in this religious sect miss out on iron supplements that are normally given during pregnancy, while their children also miss out on vitamin A supplements that are normally given um, at the health centers during the routine vaccinations. But now, thanks to uh, the biofortification of staple crops, these uh, women and children are now able to get the micronutrients that they need through the biofortified crops, which... Um, um, the community can grow or, or that families can grow on their own. Um, biofortification has also made essential micronutrients accessible to those who can't afford to buy the industrially fortified foods. And this is the case with most of the rural poor who really rely almost entirely on what they are able to produce uh, for themselves. And of course, it has been beneficial in that the micronutrients are also being delivered to those who cannot afford a diverse diet. Next slide, please. Um, the program has also been able to reach uh, the unemployed rural youth. Um, those have their own set of challenges, and these are big given the economic conditions in the country. But you know, these have been drawn to buy fortified crops for their nutritional value, but also importantly as well for their income generating potential. These include like the couple on the left, Mr. and Mrs. Chorwadza of Mazoe district. The couple is now not only growing by fortified crops for their own consumption, but they've been able to generate income for themselves through selling biofortified iron bean seed um, within the community and to, on contract as well, producing on contract for private seed companies. The other couples that have um, 
um, started growing bifortified crops as well. Uh, a young couple, the one on the right, uh, this is from Kwekwe district again in Zimbabwe. They are also growing bifortified crops for their family and uh, um, processing the surplus into a maize popped corn snack that we call Maputi and therefore being able to generate some income from selling Maputi within the community and to school children within the community. Next slide. So in conclusion, basically, I can say that uh, biofortification has been a key component. Uh, it's a very key strategy to fight micronutrient malnutrition because it uses cheap, easy to grow staple crops to deliver key micronutrients to everyone in the community, regardless of their religious beliefs, regardless of their financial status, and also regardless of their age. Uh, next slide, please. And thank you very much for your attention. Hey, thank you very much, Sakile. Uh, really appreciated uh, with all the speakers, uh, your lively definitions of your, of your programs and your work. And thank you very much for that. And Sakile, particularly the, the families that you introduced us to briefly, uh, in your presentation. Uh, so we see the dimensions of your work and kind of the data and technical aspects and where we see the progress. Uh, I'd like to give you all uh, an opportunity now uh, kind of maybe to briefly talk about or humanize some of the folks uh, and, and work that you've been doing. Uh, you know, all of us and probably just everybody in the, the 423 participants that we're at now, we've all seen something in our work that kind of continues to motivate and inspire us. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, if you could share uh, some little brief stories about, uh, that will also give us inspiration uh, of uh, examples of, of perhaps people that you've been working with, changes you've seen, improvements uh, that keep you going, that motivate you, that inspire you, uh, and foster your, your optimism. Uh, so uh, maybe Sakile, if we start um, with you, uh, kind of any, in addition to the families that you introduced us to, either them or anybody else you'd like to kind of highlight um, that you're really encouraged by uh, or frustrated by uh, in your work. I will unmute myself. Uh, thank you very much. I think one of the most um, inspiring stories that I've come across in my work um, with Harvest Plus is um, of a particular um, uh, lady in one of the districts where we work, who after learning about the benefits of uh, biofortified crops and what they do to children nutrition, this particular lady runs a preschool, a crash sort of for, for preschoolers within the district. And having learned about the advantages of biofortified crops, she made a, a decision on her own that she is going to make sure that she grows the biofortified uh, vitamin A maize and iron beans and serves the same to the children that she works with so as to improve um, on their nutrition outcomes. It's just one yeah. of the most inspiring. You know, thank you. And that reminds me of uh, a woman that I met in Uganda, and she was one of the first that was starting with uh, uh, the orange flesh sweet potatoes and the high iron beans there. And she saw how they improved kind of the health of her children. And she figured, well, if they're improving for my children, I need to make sure that kind of all the children in the area. So she rented more land, grew more of the high iron beans in the next uh, season. And at harvest, then she shared with the school. And so as I was kind of going around with her, everybody was waving at her and calling out to the uh, iron bean lady, uh, which she's which she's become known as in, in in her community. So that was really good, and the whole Harvest Plus team and the World Vision folks that are on the ground helping with the implementation there were really uh, enthused uh, on that. So thanks for set, for sharing that, Lamine, Alex. Any any stories uh, that you all can share? Thank you, Roger. I, as I said in my presentation, I, uh, the stories that mark me during my experience working in food fortification was uh, when I was in the field and I, I saw many people suffering from uh, micronutrient deficiency and especially uh, vitamin A uh, in, at the feed level. And now when I see what we have to achieve uh, in partnership with uh, many stakeholders in the region, uh, and I see the logo on the bottle of oil mentioning that this is uh, containing uh, vitamin A, and this has contributed to 
improve the vitamin A status of uh, many of the vulnerable population. This is something I, that makes me very proud of all the effort we have uh, uh, provided uh, through Ellen Keller and uh, Ellen Keller International and his partner to improve the, the, the living condition of the vulnerable population in terms of uh, micronutrition, uh, a better micronutrient status in the region. So this is this is this is what I wanted to share uh, based on uh, what my experience during the long long years uh, with HKI from 2007 to now. So I think many effort has been uh, done to improve the uh, the magnitude status of uh, the population. Yeah, excellent. Thank you for sharing that. And again, reminding that yeah, these are our our solutions that you know that we're seeing but it takes a long time to get to them and to see the results uh, from them. And so thanks for sharing that. Alex, any stories on your mind? Yes, uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Roger. Uh, what I can share with you is the fact that uh, I really see the, the power of evidence base. You know, Cameroon is a, is a big uh, pro producer of, uh, of food. You know, here in Cameroon, you have uh, cocoa production, you have banana production, you have palm oil, you have all this, all, all, all this production. And uh, it was not easy to 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 bring to 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 show to to the to the to the politicians to the to the to the decision maker that there is a, a vitamin A that there is a micronutrient deficiency in Cameroon. Sometimes they were just like, no, we have enough we have enough production of food in Cameroon. How can we talk about uh, food deficiency? So the the survey we did in 2009 with this uh, uh, evidence base showing. The burden of vitamin A deficiency more than 35 percent of children under five, and uh, was like the Ministry of Health was like wow, and uh, this was really a huge, um, a huge steps, a huge, a huge things that makes the government engage in into fortification. So my story is mainly I was part of the of the survey. I see in the in the in the, in the, in the field how children were suffering. And I was really happy to see that uh, 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 the ministry and all the decision maker was like uh, uh, by the evidence-based results uh, of the of the survey. That's so yeah, I can share with you now. Good, thank you, Alex, and thanks for reminding us that yeah, often the optics, as 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 the folks and people in in Cameroon were saying, and that you quite clearly see, uh, there we see in 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 most every country. Uh, that wow, there seems to be abundant food, uh, and again, that's the thing of hidden hunger that you're not you're not seeing it. It's not perhaps um, apparent, uh, but that the data will show uh, you know kind of what's going on. And even in the United States, I mean, the the um, anemia uh, is is on the rise and on the march uh, once again. Even in a country so so as abundant as here, and we've seen really uh, the increase in food insecurity uh, here during the the pandemic. So that's uh, opened a lot of people's um, eyes uh, to that. And then when you get down to the nutrient level, uh, that's even less apparent to see. Uh, yeah, it's really, it's really quite profound. Uh, Berner, uh, any, any stories? And what, 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 what have you seen that uh, really inspires or keeps you going? Well, um, let's, um, let's see. Let's mention three uh, examples. I think the first one, uh, which really is very interesting to me, is uh, the issue of advocacy. Uh, do you know that the UNICEF executive director, uh, James Grant, in the early stages of, uh, you know, salt iodization programming uh, supported by UNICEF, on all his travels, James Grant used to carry a little salt iodization um, a test kit. And in all his meetings with government officials and leaders, he asked them to get some salt and he would demonstrate to them whether their salt was iodized or not. And I think, uh, you know, as an example of a, uh, of a world leader uh, such as James Grant on how he had single-handedly influenced uh, the knowledge and understanding of, uh, of high-level government officials uh, in an amazing way. Um, the other thing is that um, I, I always found the interest and the willingness of salt producers to engage in, uh, in salt iodization quite amazing. And I've met many 
uh, producers in the United States, producers in Russia, uh, producers in Bangladesh, in Kenya, in, uh, in India, once you sit with them uh, around the table and you explain what it is you try to do, uh, the overlarge majority of them who have the capacity uh, are extremely interested and willing and are also willing to go the extra mile and to help also other producers who are at smaller scale, uh, at least to help them to get, uh, to get going on this. Uh, the other thing is, I think, uh, you know, if you, if you work with children, uh, you go to schools, uh, and, and if an example where I went to visit classrooms in, in India when I worked uh, for UNICEF, and you, and you use this visual prop of a salt ionization kit, and you explain to kids what this is about and so on, they have an amazing capacity, first of all, to understand, but also to influence the behavior in their own communities and households. So I think those are some of the examples where I think that uh, either individuals or, or, or certain groups uh, can uh, or did have a, a very big impact uh, on the work we did over the last decades. Thank you. I love these, I love these stories. Uh, so it's inspiring for me to hear them. And yeah, that is, it, it, it's the examples of the children, of the families, of the parents, um, and the private sector that sees the, the importance of all of this and is behind of this and, and the advocacy. Uh, so we get a lot of questions uh, I see in the Q&A box. Uh, Kristen, behind the scenes, is, has been uh, assembling them. So we'll turn to her in a minute to kind of feed us some of them. Uh, but I also want kind of our panelists to be thinking about, so we've got some key moments in 2021 coming up. There's the Food Systems Summit, uh, the UN that's coming up, uh, I think in September uh, later this year, and then also the Tokyo uh, Nutrition Summit. Uh, so we'll take maybe a couple questions or one or two questions from Kristen, but then we'll come back to this uh, question that might be a concluding thing for the panel, that is there you know, one thing that you would like to uh, say to the governments or you know, to encourage them to do in these critical uh, summits on nutrition that are coming up. Uh, so Kristen, uh, any questions uh, for, for the panelists? Thanks, Roger. Um, we have a lot of interest and a lot of questions from the audience and I apologize in advance, we won't be able to get to all of them, but let me just um, uh, ask a, a couple to continue the conversation. So a question for Alex, Lamine, and Werner. Um, what would you say to critics concerned about excess salt intake or excess oil intake? Does fortification encourage the consumption of unhealthy foods? Um, and then I would add one additional question for um, Sekile, um, which is how do you create demand and increase consumption of biofortified staple foods? So over to the panelists. Um, maybe I can uh, I can yes. step in uh, first uh, if that's okay, uh, Roger. Yes, please. Um, you know the the use of iodized salt is not meant to say that you need to use more salt in order to uh, to get a good iodine status. What we want to achieve is that people use iodized salt and do not use non-iodized salt. In that sense, it's also important that iodized salt is used in the production of, uh, let's say, uh, processed foods and, and ready to eat foods. Uh, I think we've learned a lot from uh, the, the efforts of the World Health Organization to reduce salt intake, while at the same time making sure that iodine is added. And it may well be that in some countries we need to adjust the level of fortification of salt in order to ensure that there's still a sufficient iron intake if salt intake is reduced. But this is very well, let's say, doable and it is compatible. It's not something which is in conflict uh, with each other. Back to you, uh, Roger. Thank you. Sekile. Okay, thank you very much for the uh, question. Yes, um, I think what we have noticed in all our, because we have a number of demand creation strategies that we employ, um, as harvest plants, we promote the production and consumption of bifortified crops. 
Um, but one thing for sure is that when, when farmers or when um, the community is convinced of the nutritional benefit of the bifortified crops and the importance of good nutrition for the growth and development of their children, then they are even more willing to adopt them because everybody at the end of the day wants what's best for their children or for their families. So the biggest demand creation strategy that we've been using is nutrition education. on the advantages and the benefits of to the good nutrition. And that has worked very well. Thank you, Nola. Thank you, Sakile. You were breaking up a little bit, but I think we got most of the, uh, uh, the gist of it. And yeah, the importance of... Uh, uh, yeah, creating this 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 demand and kind of this, uh, 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 in addition to uh, creating the the incentive for the farmers to plant this, but then the incentive that they need from the consumers uh, and demand on this front um, as well. Uh, so thank you, Alex Lamine. Uh, kind of anything you'd also mentioned, Alex, particularly some of the obstacles, including the high costs. So on the marketing front uh, of this and demand aspect of this, uh, anything you guys are seeing. Okay, well, with that, I mean, uh, and I mean, we'll complete. Uh, <clears throat> yes, talking about demand, what I want to say is that uh, the government uh, or, the, or the fortification, the, the mass food fortification strategy is not to create, uh, the one of the objectives is not to create the demand because the main objective is really to make it uh, mandatory, compulsory, because uh, it's, it's normally to resolve uh, a national health problem, you know, and uh, sometimes you make it mandatory because uh, all of insult hydration, all the refined cooking oil salt in the market should be fortified. So it's not a matter of demand; it's a matter of 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 doing that. All oils present in the market should be. Uh, should be fortified. Though the, so the the main things to do for the government is to ensure that uh, all the oils in the market are fortified to avoid any any problem of uh, you know uh, the ones that not fortifying uh, has a less a less production uh, cost. So uh, concerning the the premix, as we were talking about, yes, there is a, there is a problem here uh, with the with the premix who is produced abroad and which is important and uh, it's increasing the cost of the of the of the of the production the government is all the time uh, having some meetings to, through the nffa to making the industry accept to support this additional cost because according to all this social uh, uh, disturbance in, in the country. The country is the common, common, common government has fixed the cost of of uh, of staple food like uh, refined oil. So industry cannot increase the cost as they want. So they said you have to sell it to sell it at this cost. So uh, it's like an obligation to, uh, to to so to to resume. There is no a specific strategy to to increase the demand. Mainly is to, uh, there are some campaign, marketing campaign to aware, to make the population aware of the fact that there is a, a fortified oil in the market. This is the logo you have to follow why, when you want to, 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 to buy fortified oil. Uh, government controllers are trained and aware of the fact that in the market, they should uh, remove from the market all the oil that are not complying with the, with, with the legislation. This is really the huge problem we have. We have yeah, yes. So uh, this is what I can say for now. I mean, if you have something to add about that. I think this is a, this is a relevant question. Uh, it's a big challenge uh, to, uh, to manage when you are asking people to consume by, uh, fortified uh, cooking oil with vitamin A. And at the same time, you have to deal with the uh, risk of uh, no, no communicable disease 
with uh, e increased consumption of, uh, of oil. But I think as mentioned by Alex, uh, what we try to, 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 to point out uh, during our uh, campaign, communication campaign, is to involve the uh, consumers association in order to let the people know what is the distinction between the fortified uh, cooking oil and the unfortified one. And uh, uh, at the same time, the, because the fortification uh, uh, program is involving all the stakeholders uh, coming from the industry, from the uh, Minister of Health, at the same time, we have some component of com communication from our partner, from the Minister of Health, which is uh, educating population to try to avoid excess uh, consumption of oil in order to, 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 to avoid any no communicable disease uh, due to uh, excess consumption of oil. But I think this is, uh, it's not how I aim to, 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 to push people to uh, consume excess oil, but it's really to make people uh, uh, aware about the need to to do the good uh, choice when they are buying the, the oil with uh, the need to have a, a logo to identify the product, which is uh, uh, fortified. Yeah, thank you. And we see kind of from, 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 from all of you, uh, yeah, this importance of the education uh, of both the consumers, the producers, the governments involved, uh, you know, the, that the benefits of these and kind of what the products are about and and uh, uh, yeah, where they are and the benefits uh, from all of this. Uh, so we'll return to that, the, perhaps the, the final question on uh, yeah, the opportunities <laughs> that await uh, later this year at these two big nutrition uh, moments. But we have one final speaker and I wanna make sure that we uh, have, have time for her uh, uh, and that the audience is all still with us uh, for that. Uh, so I'd like now like to call on our, our final speaker to help us uh, uh, continue with the conversation uh, and uh, 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 then that she'll also be around for maybe the final question as well. Uh, so uh, uh, this is Chef uh, Anayata Dondi. Uh, she's an Indian chef who received her training at India's Hotel Management Institute in Lake Cordon, Lake Cordon Bleu. Bleu. Anahita is a, a well-known champion of her traditional Parsi food uh, culture and promotes uh, lost recipes and ingredients. She aims to be a youth icon uh, and an inspiration uh, for aspiring female chefs in India uh, and around the world. So, Chef, thanks for joining us uh, from, from Delhi uh, and uh, over to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning and good evening to everyone. And thank you for letting me speak, uh, part of the chef community. Uh, it's an absolute honor to be here and to listen to all the speakers before me. I would like to just tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Anaita Dhundi. I am a chef in New Delhi, India. Uh, I run a restaurant called Soda Bottle Opnawala. This restaurant actually promotes local seasonal sustainable food. The community that we've grown our restaurant in has a lot of ingredients which are absolutely local and seasonal. And most importantly, what we try and do with the food is promote um, and most importantly, be proud of Indian food. And uh, the restaurant is called Soda Bottle Oknavala. So if you're ever in India, in New Delhi or in another city, because we've got eight outlets all over India, please do come and visit us. I'd also like to talk to you a little bit about the chef community that I'm part of. It's called the Chef's Manifesto. The Chef's Manifesto is a network of 700 chefs from 88 countries. Uh, it is a manifesto made by chefs for chefs. And as chefs, we believe we can be powerful advocates for a better food future. We can inspire people to make changes in their kitchens and communities. So think about the last dish that you ate um, think about why you're having that green smoothie or think about why you're eating quinoa or anything that's influenced your um, change in your habits or your diets. It's chefs that actually create dishes. It could be delicious. It could be nutritious. It could look good. And when you see that on social media or at your nearby restaurant, you start actually creating that at home and eating more of it. So as chefs, I think we do hold that power um, of advocating healthy, nutritious 
delicious and good looking food. So the Chef's Manifesto actually has eight thematic areas. And I wanna to talk to you about one thematic area, which is very important. It's the number eight. It is known as nutritious food, which is accessible and affordable for all, which means that we work towards getting people healthy meals, school meals, working with your communities, your local NGO groups, um, all of that. So it's great, it's absolutely fantastic to hear the three success stories showcasing how fortified food is reaching to the most vulnerable, especially the presentation that I heard um, about iodine and iodized salt. And uh, you won't believe it, but in India, in every household, you will find iodized salt. And as a chef, I have some here with me. So this is um, iodized salt, and you'll find this in every household. As a chef, I have been personally championing millets. Um, for a lot of us who might not know, millets are a small grain. You'll find that in India and Africa. And there are different versions uh, and there are different uh, types of millets. Um, so there are about eight millets. And personally, I've been advocating it because it grows locally in India. And a lot of people don't know how to cook or they've forgotten how to cook it. Um, and in my restaurant, I have been trying for the last three years to get people to order millets, um, to order the dishes which have millets. And trust me, it's been an absolute nightmare. It's so difficult to convince people to actually choose healthy. Um, and they, you know, they know that it's a healthier version of a dish, but they would still rather choose something which is fried or which is high in calories, but not choose something healthy. But over the last year, I have seen that there has been this shift and people are more aware about what they're eating. They're more aware about what's on their plate um, and they want to know more about the ingredients and where they're coming from. So fortified foods aren't just about reaching the most vulnerable, but about helping everyone and honoring food. It's literally not just for a certain group of people, but for everyone. And as chefs, we can create those flavors and we can connect. Fortified ingredients incorporated into dishes actually build dignity and respect. And I want to tell you a little bit about the ingredients that we use. So in India, you would find wheat, you would find rice, you would find oil, and you would also find milk, uh, which is fortified. In most of our restaurants, we use milk, which, is in, which comes in a tetra pack, uh, which is fortified with vitamin A and vitamin D. Uh, it's used in our chai and in our coffees regularly. So that's something that I thought I should share with you. Um, the last one year has been really, really hard for the f &B industry because of COVID-19. Um, honestly, we had to rethink our strategies as restaurant owners and chefs and COVID-19 has impacted um, us very, very badly, honestly. It was, our restaurants were shut for a couple of months um, and we had to rethink our strategies. So our restaurant menus are smaller now, uh, our focus on food wastage is even higher. Um, and most importantly, we wanna help our community and the people around us and get them the right food. So I have been working with a partner NGO, which is called the Robin Hood Army. So the Robin Hood Army is an, uh, is an organization that actually collects surplus food from restaurants um, and they give it to uh, different uh, groups of people who actually need it. So it could be children, it could be women, it could be um, old people. Uh, so it, it, it could be different groups of people. And yesterday on Republic Day, I actually, um, I actually spoke about the impact of fortified ingredients and I made cookies for students. So those cookies were given to students and uh, they really enjoyed it. And they were made with fortified rice and they were made with fortified wheat um, and milk. So that was something that I, um, as a chef, could impact. Lastly, I just like to say that this is how chefs are working in different communities and we all have a role to play. Increasing our nutrition in our food is only going to be helpful for the entire community and for the generations to come. I hope we as a community can do that. So let's all get involved. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you very much, Chef Anahita. Uh, sorry if I pronounced your name twice, or two, two different ways the first time, uh, getting used to it. But thank you very much for this very important uh, 
and powerful message in the chef's per perspective. Uh, and, Thank you. Uh, I'm so sorry for any disturbances. Oh, no, that was fine. We could see you're in a working kitchen, right? That uh, so this is uh, uh, impressive. So that was uh, that was fine. And I look forward to, uh, yeah, visiting uh, your restaurant and trying some of these things the next time uh, I'm in I'm in India. Uh, so uh, let's go uh, final time to Kristen. Any uh, other uh, uh, particular question from the audience uh, that you're seeing. The chef will also uh, participate. Uh, so there'll be that, uh, any question from Kristen. And then, uh, yeah, I'll encourage you all to kind of share your key message as well, particularly pointing to these two important summits on nutrition coming up later in the year. Uh, so Kristen. Sure, um, thanks Roger. I have two questions, which I'll just share with, uh, for, for any of the panelists to answer. Um, that have been coming up a lot in the Q&A box. So one is regarding, um, there, are, there are multiple um, interventions and programs happening in countries with a high burden of malnutrition. Um, there are supplementation programs, there are, there are programs with fortification and biofortification. How do those programs work together? And is there a danger of overconsumption or overdose of vitamins and minerals from um, these multiple different programs. And then second question is, what are your views, um, panelists, on the fortification of snacks and fast foods? Uh, we've been focused mainly on staple foods here, but, but what are your views on, on encouraging corporations to fortify other products that perhaps are not uh, are, are not so, um, um, not as healthy um, or not as much a standard part of people's everyday diets. Over to you all. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, Werner, would you like to, uh, to start? I see um, you nodding your head, so uh, you're taking notes, so have at it. I thought that would nod my head because it looks wise, so. Uh, <laughs> But um, uh, let me start by, by thanking uh, Anahita for a fantastic presentation and for uh, showing us the back of iodized salt uh, in India. India has come a long way uh, since I was there uh, in, what is it, 2003 uh, to 2007. Um, to the two questions, uh, multiple interventions, how do they interact and how they uh, relate? I think the, the most important thing for salt iodization is that um, I think countries nowadays should have a set of guidelines and a set of standards on a package of uh, interventions for food fortification. Uh, there should be uh, levels set for the fortification of different foods, uh, for example, of course, for, such as for salt, uh, but also for, for example, the, the fortification of wheat flour with, uh, with folic acid, uh, fortification with iron, the fortification of vitamin A in, in fats and, and oils and so on. So I think uh, instead of a one-by-one one nutrient or one-by-one one food uh, to have separate uh, guidelines and standards, it should be combined, interacted. In that way, a government has an understanding and oversight on the amount of foods which are fortified. And uh, at the same time, there should be a monitoring system on the uh, nutritional status of the population. Unfortunately, many countries don't do that often enough. And I think especially in situations where you see a shift in the number of foods which are fortified, it's important, I would say, to do once every five or maybe every five to 10 years, a good survey so that you know where you stand. So that's number one. Um, is there a risk of overdosing? Uh, that relates to my last point. You do need regular surveys to monitor nutrition status, micronutrient status of the population. For salt uh, that exists in a number of countries and in a number of countries indeed, there was advice to reduce the level of fortification with iodine after it was concluded that the uh, iodine status of the population moved upward. Um, with respect to the fortification of processed food and fast foods, um, at the time where we see that for salt, for example, the reduce of table salt is reduced, also because of uh, the guidelines by WHO, it may be that some population groups are again at risk of deficiencies, and therefore 
the use of iodized salt in processed foods we think is necessary and we think is important. But again, provided that there is a regular monitoring of the situation in the population. Back to you, Roger. Uh, thank you, Werner. Uh, so I'll uh, let's go to the to the to the remaining uh, panelists. Uh, if there's one uh, uh, thought that you have uh, about all of this, either the questions or again, you know, any thoughts on, you know, hey, world leaders are gathering at these two important summits. Here's something that I'd like to see them uh, do. So we've got about five minutes left. Uh, so maybe a minute uh, from each of you guys will be will be great. So Sakile. Tequila, can you hear? Are you frozen or? Okay, go... thank you very much, Roger. Um, I think uh, of, uh, the, the risk of overfortification, but I just want to, may I switch off my video and speak with my video off? Does yes. that improve? Okay, fine. I wanted to add that um, it's been well said by Wena on the issue of the importance of monitoring, but I wanted to also add that when it comes to biofortification, talking of vitamin A maize, what we have in the, vit in the vitamin A maize are beta carotenes, which are converted by the body to vitamin A. So that does not have a risk of uh, intox um, vitamin A toxicity because the body only converts what it needs. So they do not come as, as vitamin A itself, but as beta carotenes which are converted. And in terms of the ask that I may have um, for governments as they meet for the summits that you've spoken about is many governments in Africa, they've input subsidy programs, which have an impact on what uh, communities grow they provide seed and they provide input. So maybe we need to have these input subsidy programs being more nutrition sensitive, that is uh, including seeds of uh, crops like the biofortified varieties. Thank you very much, and over. Thank you, Sakila. Lamine. Yeah, thank you, Rogers. I just uh, want to contribute to the two questions. Uh, the first one is about uh, to how we can avoid uh, over, uh, overdose with many uh, uh, intervention, micronutrient intervention which are in place in many of the country. I think one thing we should take into account is the fact that all these interventions should be coordinated by the government and we will need to have a strong monitoring system who will help us to know what is the contribution of each of, of this in, uh, intervention in terms of uh, 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 micronutrient intakes for the population. For the second point, it's about the the the, the the, the choice of the snake has food fortification vehicle. Just want to mention that uh, the vehicle that has been selected in many of the countries, uh, the selection has been based on survey like the food traffic assessment tool, which uh, indicate what is the level of penetration of this, this food. And based on that, we have selected uh, the main staple food in the countries. But now, uh, even we, we we decide to to integrate the snack food, it will be they will have just a low coverage because we have a, a contrast which is related to the affordability affordability of this uh, of this product for the main population we, we, which are in majority uh, vulnerable. So I think uh, we there is a there is a constant we need to 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 to, to, to deal off. But I think in how context with the poverty, uh, which is uh, observed in uh, many of the settings where we are implementing the program, I think using the staple food with the coordination around the government would be the best, uh, the best idea. Thank you, Lamine. Alex. Okay, I think uh, to tell you again, Lamine, I will just add something that uh, I want to, to put an emphasis on data. And data, data is powerful. We need to, to encourage to work to make our our deciders to 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 to, to found and to and to and to be part of data collection because data are really powerful. As Werner said, if you have uh, frequent monitoring of data that we can analyze and see that the um, the uh, 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 level of uh, of uh, vitamin A intake is high than the ones normally it should it should be, you can adjust. And uh, as Flamin said, uh, programs should talk. H H, H to order because we have uh, several programs in our countries and, and it's really we need to 
we, we need to, 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 to discuss together. And finally, I think by choosing a snack to 45, even if it is consumed by, by, by most of the, of the population, we should do, we should, we should, we should do, we should, should be careful to not create another problem because we should, be, we should, should choose the snacks but we will not bring another problem by solving the problem of vitamin A or, or, or iron. So that's what I can add to, to what Lamin said. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. So Chef Anaita, we'll leave you with the final uh, word from the, the panel. Uh, any, any thoughts or charge to uh, uh, the world leaders as they gather uh, to discuss nutrition uh, at a couple summits later this year? Uh, I was just trying to unmute myself and I was answering a couple of questions in the Q&A session. Um, there were some questions about iodine and Indian cooking. And I think that it's uh, something that I can just, you know, quickly talk about. Um, so iodine, um, I mean, we use iodized salt in our everyday cooking. It's, it's used in every part of our meal. Um, it's found in restaurants, in households, you'll find it everywhere. But uh, like you said, in higher temperatures, uh, you could be losing it. Or if you wash it, if you wash your vegetables with it, um, you know, you're going to be losing it in the water. So uh, I just want to say that we also have, um, as chefs, we season at different stages of our cooking. So when we are rinsing or washing um, cauliflower in India, our practice is to wash it with a little bit of salt and a little bit of turmeric. And we put turmeric because it's an antiseptic. And if there are any worms, which are found, you know, uh, it, it, they are found in organic farms, actually. Um, but we use that method to actually remove um, any bits of dirt or anything that is not right. So the antiseptic from the turmeric helps and the salt um, as well helps. But so we season it in different ways. So we season it when it gets washed. We season it when it's in the pan. We season it at the later stage when we taste it and we need to add more salt. So there is iodine absorption. So don't worry about that. Plus, um, most importantly, we use butter, which has salt. So we use salted butter every um, day as well. So salted butter gets used in biscuits, um, cakes, uh, whatever it might be. So. It's, it's just not just the addition of salt to dishes, but it's also to other products. Um, and I've been researching, uh, you know, ab about food fortification in India, and it's been happening for a couple of years. And now I think they want to fortify even more ingredients and dishes like biscuits um, readily available, which are fortified with vitamin B and uh, folic acid as well. Thank you, Chef. Uh, really appreciate that. And thanks for your perspective. And thanks to all the panelists. Uh, this has been really great. Uh, thanks for all your thoughts. Um, and Victor, your opening comments. Uh, greatly appreciate it. I know the, the, the audience, I'm sure, has really valued this and appreciated it. They've really stuck with us uh, through the time. Uh, so uh, appreciate that. So thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us. Uh, so we basically come to the, to the end of today's webinar. Uh, and as we had said, it was the first in a series of monthly conversations on staple food fortification leading up to the UN Food Systems Summit in September and a Tokyo Nutrition for Growth Summit in December uh, of this year. And so, yeah, we hope that the world leaders uh, have been also paying attention to this or their staffs have been just to see how important uh, this all is, the food fortification, the biofortification, the finally conquering uh, the hidden hunger and the micronutrient deficiencies and how it's important for the children of the world and the mothers of the world, but ultimately for all of us, because we all benefit uh, from this when our children are as healthy and productive as possible and reaching the, the, the potential uh, that they have. So please join us for our next con conversation in late February, which will have the focus on uh, the private sector to tackle the fortification uh, unfinished agenda. You can find out more information on the series at the link which uh, Christian has put in the Q&A uh, and which we can see on the screen uh, now. Uh, and again, thanks for being part of today's event. And we look forward to having uh, you join us again in February uh, and throughout the year uh, at this schedule. So uh, again, it'll be a big year for uh, nutrition. So uh, let's keep the momentum going. So 
thanks to everybody, uh, the panelists, the audience, and uh, have a wonderful day or evening or tomorrow if you're closer to tomorrow than, <laughs> than you are for the rest of the day. So thank you very much.